jury rig system. But it seems to be working. Um, and welcome. Welcome to number three of the Center for Artistic Activism Fundamentals uh, webinar series. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Still uh, scrambled here. So uh, my name is Steve Lambert. I am, but not Steve. Duncan. I'm Steve Duncan, and collectively we're the Steves. Um, we're the. This is your first time. We're the co-directors of the Center for Artistic Activism, and we're a research and training institute that uh, works with artists to get them to strategize a little bit more like activists, and activists to get them to create a little bit more like artists. And the reason we're doing this uh, webinar series is over the last seven years we've done all this research and work with activists of all kinds uh, and artists to help them be more effective and more creative in their work. And after the election, we decided we needed to get this information more out in the world as quickly as possible. Um, do you know I looked at Mr. Rogers? Yeah, I've known that for years. <laughs> uh, so, um, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, what what do we mean by artistic activism? Yeah. Which um, some of you watching this might think like, oh, I know this. Some of you might not have uh, even bothered to watch this because you're like, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. Um, but we find that the terms are used very loosely. Um, people talk about creative activism sometimes and we look at it and we're like, what? What are you talking about? And so we have a very specific definition that we think will be clarifying and often inspiring uh, and helpful. So. Right. And that said, even though we have a very specific definition, um, it's always a definition in flux. Um, it, it, there's a process of what's great about it is uh, artistic activism is that people are always creating new ways of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And so as we look back in history, as we look around the world, our idea of what it is is always expanding. Um, the format of today is going to be, we're going to talk, um, show slides for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to do 15 minutes of Q&A. And so you can ask us questions, and we'll respond to you as best you can. And it might even go faster than that. Yeah. We'll see. Um, all right, so are we ready to get into the material? We're ready to get into the material. Mr. Okay. Rogers says go. Oh, yeah, and one thing, if you're, I, I say this every time, but if your sound goes out or something, or you have some problem with your inter internet connection, we are recording this. It will be archived, and you can watch it later if something happens, so don't worry. Um, okay, so. Let's share this. Let's share <laughs> this. Yeah, yeah, all right. There we go. All right. So uh, what is artistic activism? So before we start, we kind of like to unpack some of the baggage we have around these words. Yeah, I mean, when I hear the word art, uh, it usually makes me want to reach my revolver. Um, I, I think of these sort of late night. I went to an art school, even though I'm not an artist. These late night sort of you know sessions where we endlessly talk about, well, what is art, man? Oh, God. Yeah. And uh, I remember the first time somebody called me an activist, I was insulted because um, I was like, I have a lot of interests. That was <laughs> my definition was an activist was like only one thing. And you realize what we're all doing, no matter how long we've been practicing this, is we carry a lot of baggage with us. Yeah. So we're so going to unpack some baggage. When we think about art and activism, some images come to mind, some sort of typical things. Uh, information tables and pretentiousness. <laughs> um, I want that velvet jacket. That would get me out of the. the yeah, look. yeah. The suffering that goes along with each, um, and the insanity. Uh, <laughs> so these are things that sort of come to mind when we think of art and activism, and they don't necessarily have to go together. So we want you to take these sort of ideas that you have around what art is and what activism is, and just set them aside for a moment while we. Uh, while we define them in new. Yeah, fair to say. I guess first. Okay. So what is artistic activism? Um, what we're going to do is give you some examples, show you some examples, very incomplete. Very, very incomplete. Examples, but some things that will give you an idea. There's three important lessons we want you to take from these examples, okay? The first is that uh, these will not work for you. Yeah, and exactly. It's, it's they work in a specific, specific time, in a specific place, for a specific issue, in a specific context. Um, and oftentimes, artistic activism is, how do I say, exported as this idea of rehashed, rehashed retread. Retread, exactly. As here's what worked. Now you can do it wherever you are. That's yeah. not how artistic activism Let me tell you how the flash mob works. Exactly. And you know, we like to say that all people have cultures. 
and all those cultures are different. So what works in New York City does not work in Houston, Texas, which does not work in Nairobi, which does not work in Glasgow. Um, so none of the stuff you see here will you be able to repeat and have it work the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and the second lesson here is that context matters, right? The cultural context, the time, the place, those things are important. That's, uh, you know, for the uh, trained artists out there, you know this, right? Like a Con, uh, what do they call it? Site-specific sculpture, right? Yeah. You can't versus a plop sculpture. A plop sculpture is just dumped in a place. So, Steve, if context matters and these don't work, well, why are we actually showing this? Uh, the third important lesson <laughs> is that uh, uh, all things come from combination. New things come from the past, right? So, the the what we want you to take from this is not the specifics of like, oh, look, I could I could do that project again in my town. But um, what is what's the below, the layer below? What's the um, what's the thing about it that works, or the concept that works that you could take and then reapply in that context with the, the specifics being different? And so we're going to show you some examples. Um, the first one here is Candy Chang. Yeah, and one of the reasons we like this one is because it's very very simple and elegant and. And really inexpensive. In, inexpensive. So uh, Candy Chang is an artist, um, and she is uh, was at this time um, living in New Orleans. This is right after Hurricane Katrina and the flooding of New Orleans, in which many houses were condemned, many buildings were condemned. And as New Orleans was being rebuilt, it was being rebuilt by business, for business, conference centers, convention halls, and so on and so forth. And so she looked around and said, well, where is the voice of everyday people in New Orleans to guide this redevelopment. She came up with this simple idea. And the idea was, you know those little stickers that say, hello, my name is? Well, it turns out you can actually get these printed with almost anything on them. And she got thousands upon thousands of these stickers printed with, uh, I wish this was. And then what she did is she left them in the stores. She put them up on businesses. I think the next uh, slide might show that. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm uh, doing too much at once. Ah, there you go. Um, and prompted people, everyday people walking by, just to write in about uh, what they had hoped and wished and wanted these uh, stores to be rebuilt as, or these uh, units to be rebuilt as. And so here are some of the things people wrote. I wish this was a grocery, locally owned. I wish this was a community center. Three votes. Bookstore. Cafe. With lunch. Soon. I wish this was a higher priority of the city. I wish this was repaired. I wish this was a community garden. I like the clown. I wish this was a home. And again, you know, what was the actual impact of this? We don't know. Um, it was a tactic put out there. But it, what it did was it created a space for people to imagine what would they want the city to be, and also to critically reflect upon the fact that nobody was asking us. Um, and in that way, we find it very powerful. And as Steve said, it was cheap. It was easy. It was an idea that she just ran with probably cost her $50. Yeah. And the other things we're going to show you, you know, might be a little bit more involved um, or require permission. This also does not require permission. So it's, it was a very simple project. I think the other thing, too, is it, uh, allow, it, had, it got people thinking about, like, well, what's the world I want? And then the next step is like, how do we get there, right? right. And this, this doesn't stand on its own in that way, but um, it does do that first step very well. Yeah. It had that sort of utopian kernel within it. Yeah. All right, so our next one is a Dallas drinking fountain by a woman named Lauren Butterfly, Lauren Butterfly Woods. Um, that's her, let's see, on the left there. And this was in the Dallas County Courthouse, if I remember right. And what happened was there was a sign um, on the wall that fell down. And when the sign fell down, it revealed an older sign that said that the water fountain was for whites only. And if you look at this image, you can see sort of it was faded. It was, um, but it was there. Right. It was a, it's a remnant of segregation. And so what the city had to do was decide, do we, we don't want to cover it over. We don't want to pretend the past didn't happen. But how do we create some sort of acknowledgement of this uh, that, or, or some, like a memorial, or uh, at least show the past was there? And they were having trouble coming up with ideas, and it kind of stalled out. And so what Lauren proposed was uh, this, which was a water fountain 
where when you press the button, you had to watch uh, a video, or you got to watch a video yeah, for 45 seconds. For 45 seconds of Bull Connor hosing uh, children in Birmingham in 1963. Really, sort of a poignant memory of what segregation was like. Yeah. Then the video would end and the water would start. And what, so she proposed this. Another smart thing is that she found funding for it. So the conversation wasn't, should the taxpayers pay to make this artwork? It was, should we have it at all, right? Which is an easier conversation, uh, or it gets more to the point. And what happened was uh, there, was, there was like a commission hearing where they talked about this. And one of the commissioners said, you know, if you make this water fountain uh, where you press the button and the water doesn't come out for 45 seconds, if people want to see the history, that's fine. But you're basically making that water fountain inoperable. And there was another commissioner uh, who was not white who said, I think it's fine to wait 45 seconds for water. Some of us have waited 45 years and longer. And this was on the evening news, right? And so what I love about this project is, one, the, the project itself is great. It speaks for itself, but sort of the cleverness of, of sidestepping that funding question. And then also, uh, it existed as a proposal. This is a digital rendering that you're looking at. And so she didn't actually have to make it. She just had to propose it as an idea. And, uh, and it got talked about on the news. Yeah, like she, the, com the important conversation happened without it having to be made. Now, that was true for many years. Uh, I think a couple years ago it actually did get made. And so if you are ever in Dallas, go to the county uh, building and you will find this piece. Okay. What's up next to you? Is, uh, uh, migration is beautiful. Yeah. Um, this is actually uh, an ongoing piece. Um, we, we started out in the summer of 2012. And uh, bring up the, the yep. picture. And it started out as a group of undocumented youth immigration activists who traveled around the Deep South when all of these counties and, co and states were passing legislation against immigration as a way to say, we're here, we're immigrants, and we're not afraid. Because what they found the most debilitating thing about all of this anti-immigration was the fear that it bred in people without papers. And so they wanted to actually go down south, demonstrate, but more, not just demonstrate against the state, but to demonstrate, using that double idea of what demonstration means, to other undocumented immigrants that it's OK. That you can be proud of who you are, and you can walk the street. Um, if you notice the bus. Well, I think, too, there was a humanizing thing, yeah. right? So it's like we're, we're more than just, you know, the, the statistics on the news or these, you know, uh, as our president-elect would say, rapists and thieves coming over the border. Bad hombres. Bad hombres. We're actually people. And if you want to come talk to us, here we are, right? And you notice the bus, okay? Yeah. The bus was picked on purpose. It's a 1960s bus. And it was picked in order to resonate with the memories that people had of another civil rights struggle, which was when the Freedom Riders came down from the North to help uh, register people to vote in the South. And it was a very conscious use of the symbolism of the civil rights movement to sort of draw attention to the civil rights of immigrants. We also noticed something else as well. The butterflies. The butterflies, OK? The symbol of Undocubus became these butterflies. And what's wonderful about these butterflies is that they're monarch butterflies. They are beautiful. They're gorgeous. I mean, who doesn't smile when you see a butterfly flapping its wings? Yeah, if you don't like butterflies, you're a jerk. Yeah, exactly. And they migrate from Canada to Mexico, Mexico to Canada every single year. And so by picking this idea of the monarch butterfly, they did a couple of things. They turned the image of the bad hombre <laughs> into a beautiful butterfly. Um, and they also made the point visually, that migration is the most natural thing in the world. You can't put up a wall against a butterfly. Yeah, like trying to stop immigrants coming, uh, moving across North America is like trying to stop butterflies. It also had some added bonuses, which is, if you go on, uh, yeah. it became part and parcel of their, uh, their campaign. A very symbol. easy symbol to adopt, also a very easy symbol to replicate. Exactly. And as this uh, young child, you can see that these were uh, made out of cardboard, and people would wear them at demonstrations, which had an added value because 
the police arresting young protesters can actually play pretty well for the police on the news. These are bad hombres. We're protecting the, um, you from them. But arresting a bunch of butterflies, it actually just does not play very well in the news. And it became a sort of way to protect themselves against um, brutality by the police. So the, uh, the image itself got reproduced, and uh, this is an image by Fabiana Rodriguez. So the movement started using it, and then Fabiana, an art, a specific artist, sort of took the symbol and improved it. I think she designed a poster that was like yeah, that. Yeah, and she was working with a group called Culture Strike, um, people like Ken Chen, Fabiana Rodriguez, and others. They really kind of took this symbol and did what they could do, which is professionalize it and then distribute it. And so it became a way that artists could step into a struggle and actually help out with the struggle in a really instrumental, helpful way and bring it to another level. Okay. So this is an example of you know, this movement back and forth between organizations or, uh, and, and individual artists and a different model of working together. Um, okay, so we have examples of artists. We have examples of organizations. This is an example of a government. Right. And this is the government, uh, local government of Bogota, Colombia, um, which in the mid-1990s, um, a uh, former philosophy professor named Antanas Marcus was elected. And Bogota, Colombia had a lot of social problems. Well, one of the problems was traffic fatalities. Um, people in Bogota just paid no attention whatsoever to crosswalks, traffic lights. They drove wherever they want. They walked wherever they want. And Antonis Marcus knew he had to do something. Yeah, these people were not deterred by the law. And so what he realized was the law might not stop them, but embarrassment would. And so he hired... Well, first what he did he, he fired the yeah. entire traffic police force, which is notoriously corrupt, and then rehired 2,400 traffic mimes. And they look like this. So he literally hired mimes to direct traffic. This happened. Uh, Not only did it happen, it got reproduced. Actually, most of these photos are from Caracas in Venezuela. Yeah. So if you were a jaywalker, this um, uh, mime might follow you and instead of giving you a ticket, would just mock you. Um, and if you were like driving into traffic, uh, they would you know, come up alongside you and make fun of you and everyone would laugh. And that actually was more effective than issuing tickets. Traffic fatalities were reduced by 50% within a couple of years of this and other creative programs in Bogota, Colombia. So this kind of creative thinking to bring about change is not solely the realm of artists or activist organizations. It actually can happen within these bigger institutions and government. You know, we talked to Antonis Marcos, who's a hero of ours, and we asked him about how it worked in Venezuela and other Latin American countries. And again, it proves our, the rule we came up with, it didn't work as well. It really had to do with a particular culture of Bogota, Colombia, in which people did not respect the law, but they cared a lot about what other people thought about them. Yeah. Okay, so our next one is War on Smog and Chongqing. So Chongqing is a city in southwest China. Um, and like many cities uh, in China, it is just inundated with smog. Um, and like many cities uh, in China, you're not allowed to protest. Um, political protest is essentially outlawed. And so what a bunch of protesters and artists did in the city of Chongqing was really interesting. They created a protest, but they clothed it in the trappings of art. Um, they did things like had public marriages. Um, the idea of a public marriage and the idea of dressing up in your gown and your suit and having photos taken you is a big part of modern contemporary Chinese life. And so they used that, um, but they did it with gas masks. Um, they also had a performance troupe of young women in tutus, but also gas masks. And what was really useful about this, or what's really uh, the sort of takeaway, the core is that this isn't going to work in another city. It doesn't have the right symbols or signs in it. But what we've found working with activists and artists in very repressive regimes like China and Russia is they are allowed to say things with art that they can't say with direct political protest. The state understood this was a protest. The passers-by understood it was a protest. But because they could point to it as art, they were allowed the sort of space to say things which would normally 
not be allowed to be said in China. So our last one is Alfredo Yar. Alfredo is an architect, tell me the country. Chile. From Chile. And he's very successful. He lives here in New York now. And what happens when you become a successful artist like Alfredo is that you get invited to come to different places around the world to, um, to do a project. So Alfredo was invited to Skogal, Sweden. This is what Skogal looks like. Um, it's a logging town in Sweden, if you've never been. And uh, they make paper. So they took him around. They said, this is our town. You know, we make paper. This is the factory. And they took him to all the different places in Skogal. Now, there's only one industry and one company in Skogal, and this is what they do. So they took him to the library. They took him to the grocery store. They took him to the gym. They took him to all the different institutions uh, and, and businesses in the city, which are all owned by the company. It was a factory town, right? And because it's Sweden, it's actually a pretty nice factory town. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but the town has provided everything. Right for the families of, of the workers that work there. And so he said, well, where's the museum? And they said, oh, actually, we don't have a museum. And he said, OK, so for my project, I want to there. They said, that's why we're bringing you out. That's why we bring artists, right? And he's like, well, I think you should have a museum. My project is going to be to build you a museum. And so he built them a museum out of the logs and paper that they use in the town, right? So um, this is the museum at the opening. And, they, and he, all the artwork in the museum was from local people. And tons of people showed up to the opening. Um, they had lines to get in. It was very crowded, like most successful openings. The mayor came and did a ribbon cutting ceremony. Because uh, it's Sweden, there was an Oompa band that played. Um, and it was, it was packed and very popular. And then people started to notice that it was called the 24-hour museum. And they said, why is it called the 24-hour museum? And he said, well, it's because in 24 hours, we're going to burn it down. What? And so he said, uh, they said, no, we, we don't want that. You know, like, we like the museum. We want you to keep it. And he said, sorry, that's, that's the deal. So they went to the mayor, and they said, look, this artist is crazy. He wants to burn down the museum. You have to stop him. And the mayor said, no, actually, that was the terms that we set. Uh, he, he is going to burn it down. Um, that's the project, sorry. And so the people started to get other people together and they said, you know, like, this guy's crazy, he's going to burn our museum down. Um, so they went to the fire department and they said, look, we talked to the mayor, we talked to this artist, do you know they're planning on burning the museum down? You have to stop them, you're the fire department. And they said, no, that's not true. Actually, we're the ones that are going to burn the museum down. And the next day, after 24 hours had passed, they lit it on fire and they burned the museum down. Wow, that's really an inspiring story, Steve. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, so this comes up every once in a while. We show this, and people are like, that would be incredibly disempowering. And um, you know, I think in most cases it would be. And what makes Alfredo amazing is that, uh, well, he went home. And about six weeks later, he got a call from the mayor. And the mayor said, the people have gotten together, and they want you to build a museum for us and make it permanent. And so what happened was he figured out how to tap into this desire that people didn't even really know that they had um, for a museum in their community. Um, show, it, show them what it could be like, take it away, and then they organized themselves to create it. And it was the first thing that the citizens of Skogal had ever asked for themselves. They'd been given everything before, and they appreciated it. But that itself was disempowering. Um, but they didn't know, to a certain extent, of what they could ask for until it was given and taken away. But one of the things we asked, we also talked to Alfredo, we're like, how did you know this was going to work? And he said, he didn't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. So this is why I want to remind you of the three rules that we told you about before. Um, Burning buildings down probably will not work for you. <laughs> the context matters, right? So, and with all these examples, what is the core thing? And the core thing with Alfredo's piece is to cultivate a desire for something and then empower people to bring it about. And the other thing, if you look, if you think about some of the examples we've had, some are simple sort of one-off tactics. Um, for example, Candy Chang just putting her piece out there 
raising discussion, giving a forum for people to write about what they would like, um, is very different than Undocubus, which was an entire campaign, and every little bit of it um, were tactics which led to objectives, which were part of leading towards goals, and were part of an overall strategy. And so artistic activism can take many forms. To be at its most effective is actually when it's not one of these one-off, but when it's integrated with a campaign. Mm -hmm. So you keep talking. I'm getting blinded by uh, <laughs> okay. the sunlight coming Okay. In. So, so, um, so the other part of this to keep in mind is these examples we showed you, and we could have showed you a lot of them. None of them are in museums or galleries. Uh, when you think about the venue for artwork as museums and galleries, it's very limiting to what's possible and what, what can be done. Um, I kind of think of galleries and museums as <laughs> sound effects. That's how they know we're not in a studio. Yeah. We're not in a fancy studio. That was yeah. just our, um, it didn't help. <laughs> I think of museums and galleries. There you go. There yeah, go. come this way. Okay. <laughs> we should do this side by side more. It's more fun. Um, uh, the the venue of museums and galleries is for like the artifacts of this work. It's not the venue for the work. So, um, and if you think of success in terms of museums and galleries, you're seriously cutting off your uh, your possibility of actually affecting change. Right. But probably 80 to 90 percent of what people think about when they think about political art is exactly things that show up in biennales, museums, and galleries. So this is where and we go to our depressing. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's where we're, now we're going to go into our critical mode, yeah. which is what is not artistic activism. Okay. And this is again, it's our personal uh, interpretation of what is not artistic activism. But you're right. Well. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but just think about it, okay? Yeah. Uh, so here's, here's one of the sort of primary, uh, what we think of as um, fallacies of artistic activism. Yeah. So this is Richard Serra's artwork, in case you don't know who Richard Serra is, he makes these big tilted arc sculptures. And he's very good at it. I mean, yeah. they're beautiful. They're amazing. Yeah. I have total respect for Richard Serra as a sculptor and a drawer. No. Um, and as, as an artist, right? And like these pieces, if you've ever never experienced one, I encourage you to do so. This is what he makes. This is what he looks like. Usually a very happy guy. Um, and around the time of the Abu Ghraib prison scandal, Richard Serra was very pissed. And um, he, this is what he looks like when he's pissed. Um, and he made a piece about how upset he was. And you may have seen it. This came out about 2004, I would guess. Um, and, you know, he took charcoal and he made an image from those Abu Ghraib prison images and then wrote stop brush on it. And this is really, it's not art that's doing political work. It's art which is about politics. Um, and there's nothing wrong with being angry about something and wanting to express yourself. I think that's completely legitimate. But the problem becomes when people conflate that with the political efficacy which is necessary for artistic activism to actually change power. In the end, this is using politics as subject matter yeah. for art. So it, art, uh, uh, Richard Serra can make artwork about anything. And he makes artwork about, you know, uh, very abstract things, feelings like uh, 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 that relate to his experience making boats and stuff, right? And then he chose to make artwork that was about the Abu Grave prison scandal. I don't think Richard Serra had any delusions that this would have political impact. If he did, those, those were delusions, right? He didn't think in terms of objectives and goals and strategy like we were talking about. It's just like, I'm mad, I'm going to make this thing, right? And you can see that he's mad in how he's drawing it. But there is no, this is not going to have the same kind of political impact as thinking about things in a more holistic way would. It also, if you start thinking about art, Political art is not art about politics, but art that works politically. It actually opens up the terrain to art that may not even have as a subject matter politics. Yeah. But it can actually work politically, even though it isn't ostensibly about a political subject. And, and at that difference, and I hope we're being clear about this, is the difference between art with political subject matter, political art, and artistic activism. Right? Artistic activism has political ambitions, thinks about affecting power, doesn't need to be recognized as art, not so much about self-expression. 
Not about using art as a topic. We have a we have a term for this. Or I mean, politics as a topic. Sorry. Our derogatory term, which is political expressionism. Yeah. yeah. So you can like abstract expressionism is I have this feeling, I'm expressing it in this moment, I'm doing it through this abstract means, and it's about my expression. Political expression is I have this feeling about politics, I'm conveying it, and this is in this moment, and this is how I feel about politics. But you know, it's nice, and like we know you're mad, and it might resonate, but we can do more. We can, like, if you want to change the world, we're going to take you seriously. And, yeah, you need to do more. You're angry about this. Yeah. yeah. I spent a lot of time in art school. <laughs> okay, so the other thing that it's not is art added to politics. Yes. Right? Now, oftentimes, this is the role artists are put in. And it has to be. It has to be put, you know. Uh, exactly. You don't have to agree to it. Yeah. Which is, you know, Activists will plan a demonstration, plan the goals, plan the objectives, and say, hey, we actually need a poster. Um, can you design us a nice poster? Yeah, like they come to you two weeks before and are like, here's when it is. Here, Can you make this? Make it pretty. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, no, there is. Good posters are good. Okay, well, you're angry about this. Uh, I mean, I was an activist. I asked artists to make nice posters, okay? And we got better posters than I would have made. But... It doesn't tap into the power of artistic activism because it, what it really is is it's like art as window dressing, as an added value. And the power of art and activism put together is that artists can reconceptualize things like strategies, goals, tactics from the very get go and not just as an added in. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this is like having, you know, write us a song, make us a poster, can you make us a website, all that stuff. And, and you still get asked to do this if you are an artist. Um, but you can get so, do so much more. Yeah. And those of you that are listening who are activists, you can ask artists to do so much more. And, and like bring artists in earlier. Yep. Right. And bring the part of you that's an artist in earlier into the process. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we're not talking about. So why, why is this important? Why is it important that we tell you these, to make these distinctions? things like that. There, there's a few reasons. One is that we talked about these uh, kind of baggage that we bring to activism and creativity or art, right? Activism we think of as being very instrumental. Yeah. That is, as a, an activist, you're really about trying to challenge and change power. That is, you will know if you've succeeded, you have goals, you have to want to actually uh, achieve those goals, and you pretty much know if you've done or not done. And there's no time for fun. This is the serious right. business of activism, right? And then with art and creativity, it's about like me and, and I'm resting myself. Yeah, and like, um, and you know, the, it's this connection to art therapy and feeling. No, like, no, art, I would say that you're so harsh, man. Art therapy is actually pretty instrumental. True. Okay, okay. true. Got let's that. go. Let's okay. roll it back. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so art but, but it's about you on a Sunday with your watercolors <laughs> and your coffee and just like, oh, yeah, I'm just into art, this. I'm exploring. I'm pushing school. the paint around. Art school totally damaged you. It totally damaged you. Okay, I'm going to tell you the good parts about the expressivity of art. Okay. Is that art actually is a place <laughs> in which you can sort of tap into ways of thinking and talking about reality, which is very different than... It's sort of, we've got to get things done, we've got to get them done now. It allows you to imagine different outcomes. Yes. Um, and in that way, that expressive, expressivity is actually very and valuable. exploration. And yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the ways we think about this is in terms of what art does. Is we always, when we think about art, we think of what, how it affects us emotionally, or what we call affect. Okay? And when we think of... Well, but first, I think... One of the ways we think about it is we think of these as separate things. Ah, yeah. Right? Like well, there's art that you do at this time, and then there's activism, which is like when I you know, show up at the protest, yeah. and the two shall never meet. Um, but we, we have a different approach to it, I think, which is uh, that creativity is critical, critical to effective activism from tactics to strategy to objectives and goals. So that, that was the next slide. That was yes. Really all, all along the way, right? <laughs> Like, we need to bring creativity in at every step. Yes. And so that's the value of bringing that creative, artistic, expressive, exploratory side to this work. Right. Okay. So now, ah, now I get to talk about affect yeah. and effect. Okay. So we think about activism, we think about the, its material effect in the world. Yes. That was good. 
when we think about art, we think about affect. And affect, affect meaning like feelings and emotions and stirring the soul. Right. And these things are actually quite different. Um, one is really material and the other is very emotional. But the beauty of artistic activism is it actually works through affect to actually create an effect. That is, we say art moves us, and in any activist can tell you that what you need to do with people is to have them feel that your cause is important. You need to move them off their butts and into the street. And that is about affect. And so affect actually can have and does have real effect in the world. So we started to describe this as uh, affective effect, or we would say effective affect. I think that's really complicated. I know. I could, I'm could. i surprised I just got said those out loud because it was really difficult, uh, especially when you're speaking quickly. Um, so we decided that this was just too cumbersome to say, and we made a new word to describe this, which is effect. Yeah. Um, those of you in Scandinavian countries might think of this as effect. Yeah, but that doesn't sound as good, so we call it effect. And it's not effect like this. That is not what we're talking about. It's effect like think about a pirate. Yeah. So if you want to want to use the word, just think about the pirate. Yeah. And we so effect the is the is using emotions and stirring the emotions for an actual concrete outcome. Exactly. And that's what we talk and about. And what artistic about. activism yeah. does is it mobilizes effect. Yes. Okay. So. Why else is this important? Why are we talking about this? Because I love this quote. Nothing is more dangerous than an idea when it's the only one you have. And often when we look, work with activists, not all of them, but they'll say, you know, we'll, we'll come up with an idea. The first idea, they're like, this is great. We should do it. And we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right. You know? and, and, uh, and we encourage brainstorming and drafts and iterations, right? But, uh, and, and it makes for better work. And if we're going to make great political impact, we also need to come up with a lot of ideas. Creativity is critical. This integration is critical to making effect, to have an effect on politics. And one of the ways that you can actually start to think about the multiplicity of ideas is, as Steve said, think about every idea as a draft, just a sketching of an idea. Um, enter into brainstorms with other people. There's nothing like having a group of people around coffee or beer or what have you, just throwing out ideas. And a very important thing is also to be inspired by what's been done before. Um, and so one of the things we do at the center is we created, along with the Yes Men, a uh, user-generated database of examples of creative activism called Actopedia. It currently has 1,800 or more um, examples of creative activism, artistic activism. And you can search it by issue, medium, and by region. So if you're interested in environmentalism in South America, you will find examples of environmental act, creative activism in South America. And very importantly, it only works because people post. That is, it's entirely user generated. So if you're thinking like, oh man, I made this awesome project, it should be on there. It should be on there. Exactly. And you should put it on there. And it only takes about a minute to figure out how to actually submit stuff. Super easy. Check it out. Register and be inspired. We gotta wrap up because the pops know we're here. Oh man. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so oh, the other thing too is we just talked about four or five different examples. What we're trying to do is like lay out these different ways. You know, government, uh, individual, uh, institutions, uh, activist movements working together, right? Like to sort of give you a sense of some of that landscape. But there's no way that we could tell you about all of these. So browse through it. Um, and, and you know, we had a really hard time narrowing down the examples we showed today. And we always get new examples, like literally, whoops, the other way. Um, literally, um, every time we do a slideshow, we're like, oh, wait, wait, this one. Or someone suggested something else. So yeah. it was, it's constant, it's just a constant expanding field. Yeah. So I hope this was helpful. Um, what we're going to do now is look at some of the questions in your GoToWebinar control panel there, there's a tab that says questions, and you can send us questions. And our buddy, Joe Hill, is still going to remain a mystery, I think, because she can't see the questions. So we're going to have to do this. So let's just pick one. OK. If you are an artist, how do you get organizers to factor in the art ah, of it before you can make us a poster stage? That is a great, great question, Madeline. I, I, go ahead. No, you do it. OK, so one way is to don't wait for them to come to you, right? This is, I've done this a few times where I'll have an idea 
and then find an organization and then you present what it will be like right like the the final version of it a vision of like when we were working on the uh, New York Times that announced the end of the Iraq war before it actually happened all the organizations that were involved we would go in and I would say like okay this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a newspaper. It's going to look like this. You're going to get it. It's going to say Iraq war over it. And just sort of uh, describe what the final thing was going to be like. And then I'd say, and now we want you, if you'd like, to add some articles about this topic that you have the expertise on. And then they'd be like, we can do that, right? And, it, and then I, if they were quick to say yes, then I would start adding things that I wanted them to do to help out with, right? The other thing you can do is just as an artist, join an organization. And so you're li literally there um, both as a citizen, uh, as an activist, and as an artist, and bring that perspective into every meeting you go to. Um, what makes a valuable you know, activist is someone who can bring different ways of thinking and seeing into every single meeting. So those thoughts don't get stale, so the ideas don't get stale, so we don't do the, all the tactics over and over. And so part of it is about saying, yeah, I'm an artist, but that doesn't stop me from also being an activist and just joining an organization. Yeah, and you're probably like working with them already. I think it's just uh, um, having, you know, the things we talked about last week with constructing a campaign. Once you know that structure, and sometimes I've known it better than the organizations I'm working with, they're grateful. And you can, the organizations often struggle, especially because they get so bogged down in the day to day work of having these sort of more visionary ideas that, that are more utopian, more long-term. And so coming with that, but then also understanding how to speak their language and making it concrete. Um, um, yeah, those, so those are some strategies. We will talk about this more, I'm sure, uh, future conversations. So let's see what else we got here. So from Dana, would you consider parking? Oh, parking day, yeah. OK, so parking day for those of you, thanks, Dana. Um, parking day for those folks who don't know about it, I think it's actually started in San Francisco, but now it's in quite a few cities, um, in which on one, per, one particular day, um, what happens is you, you know, plug quarters into the meter, and you do some sort of installation in that parking spot. And I've seen things like you know, community gardens. I've seen cocktail parties and so on. And what's wonderful about it is that it kind of creates this vision and idea of what could be possible in the place of cars. But I think what Dana added to that question is, how can it be leveraged as such? Because right now it's a fun little performative thing, right? Yeah. And it's one of those gestures that may start a discussion or raise awareness, yeah. but it's really not part of an overall campaign. So, for example, if I was in New York, talk with the folks at Transportation Alternatives. They're a long-term organizing group which is actually quite open to a lot of artistic expression, but they have real campaigns about things like traffic calming, creating, um, uh, creating bike lanes, um, promoting public transportation, and very importantly, they do the work that artists may not want to do, like lobbying City Hall. Yeah. And so the key would be is actually to start conversations with folks who are already doing work in kindred fields and figure out how every person who stops by to that really cool cocktail party that you created out in front of your house because you're pulling coders in, you also say, hey, the city could be like this. We could do more of this. Here's some things you can do. One, call this person. Two, write a letter to this person. Three, go actually create a parking day yourself and here are some flyers. And it's just thinking about moving, as we like to say, moving beyond the gesture. Another thing I would say is like actually approaching the city. And, and trying to work with the city. We often think of like uh, everyone as a antagonistic, in an antagonistic relationship, right? Like, the city will never approve of this. We have to do it in this radical way. Um, when it's often, not often the case, there are people within the city that might be for it, might support you, might find ways to make it permanent. Um, so those are just some thoughts. Um, okay, so I have done art-based activist projects, which I now see we're more political art and not activism. I have a new project and I'm working with an activist and organizer groups already on board. I think it meets a lot of your criteria, but this is inspiring and I'd like to, uh, I'd like to better the idea. Can I contact you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So one of the things we set up after the election is a way, uh, and I'll include this in an email that you'll get after the workshop, is a way that you can um, contact us. We will set up a small group and if you have a project idea, that group will get together and kind of help 
uh, make it as strong as possible. And it's not just going to be us. Um, what we're going to do is try to create communities because of, of artistic activists that, that can help each other out. Um, because the key here is that ideas really flow fast when you have a whole bunch of people actually putting ideas in there. I mean, Steve and I have been doing this a long time, but we're constantly learning things. We're by no means experts, but what we can do is facilitate some of that conversation, and we are totally willing and planning and actually doing it. Yeah, so I will include that link um, in the email that you'll get with a follow-up from this webinar. Um, okay, this last one we'll do, and then uh, I think we're we much just stay on track. So, um, but it's a great one. As a theater artist, this is from Jessica. As a theater artist, I wonder whether dialogue is part of artistic mm. activism at all. I've been in the room for powerful dialogue after a politically thought-provoking piece of theater. Yeah, I just got asked to do that in a couple of weeks. Mm. Um, and so I would say it is. Thank you, because now I can go do it. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is like one of the first yeah. steps. Yeah. So there's a powerful dialogue, right? People are talking about an issue. That's great. Then what? Right. And this is the key that uh, is then what? And Steve and I often bring up this idea of asking yourself always, if this dialogue goes well, what do I hope to have happen? Because that will shape the type of dialogue that you structure. Um, if the dialogue happens, then what well, then what do I want to have next? Because that's going to help you shape what you might want to do in the future. Don't ever be satisfied with the raising awareness or the dialogue. They're absolutely important, but always ask yourself, what is going to happen? What do I want to have happen from the dialogue? And we'll talk about this in the, in the future. This is going to be something we cover in, in, a, in, a, in a future webinar, but uh, one of the rules of thumb is to think in terms of behavior. So instead of like the conversation, what behavior happens as a result of that conversation? And we'll go into that into a lot more detail. But uh, um, like, you know, when they leave the theater, how do you want people to act differently? And it seems like a sort of minor difference, but it, very, it changes the way that you approach it because instead of the goal or the objective, right? We talked about this, the goals and objectives. The, the objective is not to have a good conversation. The objective is someone to do something as a result, which can change the nature of, of your strategy, can change the way that you do the work. Right, it just a very simple. It makes it more effective. Yeah, a very simple example would be, after they have a conversation, ask them to do something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and because people have had that conversation, they're going to be much more invested in actually doing that. The conversation is good because it got people out of the role of passive spectatorship and into this notion of participation, but then it can go further. Yeah. I right, could talk about that for a long I know. time. Okay. Okay. So we will. <laughs> yeah. But in any case, uh, we don't want to take up all your time. I know it's some of your lunch hour. Um, so, a couple of asks we have at the end. One is, um, please tell the folks about this that you think might be interested. We're going to be doing pretty much once a week except for holidays. Um, there's past ones. If you've missed ones, um, they are... They do connect. Yeah. And so it's helpful to watch them, uh, I think. Right. And, we, and we've taped the past ones. And so yeah. they're absolutely they're available. And we're, you're going to get an email after this if you registered. And it will have links to that. And please share those links with other people. Now, one thing, we have a favor. Um, we set up a survey so you can tell us how you like this. Um, the suggestion for this one came from the last survey. And so we're reading them and changing stuff based on that. And it's really helpful for us. We want to make this as useful as possible. So please fill out the survey. Um, and then what's our last The final one, one oh, yeah, yeah. is, yeah, you do it well. Okay. So um, uh, I've said this before. Some of you have donated already. It's very helpful because we're trying to do programs that we did not put in the 2016 budget, um, we didn't raise money for, and we're just doing them. And so like this, we did not have the money or plan for. And so um, if you could make a donation, we would really appreciate it. There'll be a link in the, uh, in the email that you get. Um, it doesn't matter how small it is, do whatever you can. You can make it monthly, um, and it would support the work that we're doing and allow us to access more people. Yeah. One of the ways to think about it is if we were just talking and you called us up and said, hey, Steve, can you come out? I have some ideas about activism. I want to talk. You'd probably buy us coffee. Um, or maybe it's midday because it's right now midday in New York. You'd buy us lunch. 
Or maybe we go out to dinner and you buy us like port, like fancy port at the end. And we'll take that. We'll if take you that. want to come out here, we'll, we'll <laughs> eat your food. Exactly, <laughs> and drink your port. I um, actually don't like port at all. But in any case, the point being is you might want to think about like your donation is like, I'm going to buy these guys a cup of coffee or I'm going to take them to lunch. Except it'll be tax deductible and it'll allow us to do other things. Exactly. We're not going to buy wine with it. Well, so um, <laughs> so um, we're going to wrap it up, but thank you. And our next one is next week. You can already sign up for it. It's going to be on history. Do you yeah. want to talk about why yeah. we're doing that? Yeah, we have this basic fundamental belief that artistic activism has been part of all effective activism going back thousands of years. This is not something which is new. It may have new relevance in an age of spectacle, um, but it essentially, and the it being thinking aesthetically about protest practices, has been part of social movements for literally thousands, thousands of years. And we'll talk about some of those movements. Yep. All right. Thank you. And uh, we will see you next time. Oh, hi. My hands are up. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.